Welcome to the final lecture in the first week uh, of classes. Uh, the previous lecture we were looking at system calls and how they interact with the operating system and how applications uh, talk to the operating system. Today we're going to look at another form of interaction between the operating system and the applications. It's called interrupts. And before that, we're going to go through briefly on just to give you an idea of how an operating system boots up and all the different forms of interaction between the operating system and any application. Okay, So the first thing that the system boots up when you hit the power button is something known as a BIOS. Right? So the BIOS is the one that actually um, starts running the operating system. Okay, So it is the one that starts up and then it checks all the devices and it looks at where the operating system itself is located, loads it up, and starts it up. Okay, So it's really split into two parts. The first part is just your uh, boot program. Okay, The boot program is the one that checks all the hardware. Okay, so if you have uh, what kind of keyboard that's plugged in, if you have more than one keyboard plugged in, if you have a keyboard, a mouse, how many flash devices have you plugged in. So it checks all these parameters and then builds a table. Okay, it's just a simple table. Um, and traditionally, this table and it's all the details that the operating system can look at. So the operating system has to be aware of what data structure the BIOS itself is writing. Okay. These days it's known as EFI. Uh, it's a slightly different process, but the general idea is the same. There's some piece of firmware uh, on the motherboard that checks all the hardware, uh, checks all the timing parameters, loads up a table that the operating system can look at. The second part is your operating system initialization. This is the one that mostly runs in software. There is not much hardware involvement. It initializes kernel data structures, and most of these are uh, in the high-level programming languages such as C. Uh, the operating system itself is a somewhat looks like Objective C, which is closer to C++. Um, but in general, when you start working with it, you'll see it. And what this does, it reads the table, and then it figures out what hardware devices that are actually plugged into the machine, and then it initializes the state. So the BIOS is the one that just simply reads the configuration. The operating system is the one that initializes all the devices to the state, uh, to the point at which they can start operating. For example, waking up the hard disks, uh, reading up specific blocks, uh, or your flash, pinging them so that your flash is ready to go, mounting it, things like that. And then, once it does that, now it can start creating a whole bunch of processes. Processes is the vessel of execution um, that we'll see. So any application that wants to run has to run within a process. Okay? And so it starts up all these processes, and now the hardware is all initialized, and now the application can start interacting with the hardware. After this is done, and the basic process has been started, the OS runs a user program if available. Um, otherwise, it just enters an idle loop. Okay? And an idle loop is just um, it's a fancy word for saying it's just I'm going to wait around until something happens. Okay? So if you look at... Um, the primary responsibilities of an idle loop, it's an infinite loop. Okay, It performs things like system management and profiling. Sometimes it doesn't even do that because you don't want it to consume a lot of resources when there's nothing running on the system. right? So your operating system has to be thin enough that if there's nothing running on it, that it doesn't consume any resources. Okay, And what it does is on some systems, and in most systems these days, if it finds that there are no applications that are running, then it just halts a processor, enters a low power mode. Uh, we'll get into what the low power mode itself is, but essentially it's a state in which the operating system is, uh, is gone into a, a situation where there's nothing running on this system, but there might be something running in the near future. So what it wants to do is essentially sit around and wait there looking for something to run. Okay? But it doesn't want to keep looking for something to run all the time because then that's going to, just looking for something to run is going to consume a lot of resources. So it enters a low power mode 
where uh, the processes are all waiting and it can easily figure out if something wants to run on the ass system and then it can wake up easily. It's not shut down. Okay. And in general, the OS, when it's in idle mode, has three different forms of waking up. There's the system calls, which we've already looked at. There's interrupts, which we'll talk about here. And then there's another one, uh, exceptions, which typically are triggered only in extraneous circumstances, right? Like a divide by zero, right? So it triggers that. When you have a divide by zero, we don't want the whole system code to go down, right? So in this case, you want the, hard, the operating system to handle it or the application. So it's somewhat like Java exceptions, right? It's not, it's not commonplace. Interrupts are the way the uh, I.O. devices interact with the system, and systems calls are the way the application interacts with the system, okay? So interrupts go between the OS and the hardware, and system calls go between the OS and application, okay? So they are for different purposes. And we've already looked at the two modes of execution, user mode and supervisor mode in the system. Uh, user mode is essentially anything, any of your user level application, and supervisor mode is unrestricted access. That's complete access to the hardware, and this is where the OS normally runs. Okay. So if you look at the overall control flow in an OS, uh, then it has multiple different things. So first one is, so you're in the idle loop, and after you get it in from the initialization. So this is step one, right? So you go to the idle loop, there's nothing that wants to run. And then what's going to happen is you could have your keyboard or something uh, interacting with the OS, you know, when you hit the keys. So that's all your interrupts, right? So that uh, you can have your hardware devices interacting in this fashion. Uh, just bear with me. We'll get into more details in a second. But interrupts, you can also have software applications trigger interrupts. So you can also trigger interrupts in software or hardware. Normally, uh, it's more often used for hardware because it's really slow. System calls are where your applications interact. And normally this is very fast, right? So the system calls themselves are split into two, those which change any state, those which just reading something. And the system calls that only read something are normally much quicker, okay? And then finally, there's the exception where something bad happened possibly, and the hardware or the CPU in this case essentially throws an exception uh, to the OS say, I don't know how to handle this, figure it out then uh, the operating system has to kick in there. Finally, any after you finish all of this, and so this, these would all be step two, one of these would be step two. Um, when you're handling an interrupt, you could possibly have a system call as well. So there are multiple, or you, you could be handling a system call or you could get an interrupt, right? So there are multiple ways in which this could happen. Normally, you don't have exceptions when you have either of these because then that would be bad. That is the operating system itself is an exception at that point, okay? Finally, there's the RTI, which essentially stands for return uh, from interrupt. And so RTI stands for return from interrupt. And it's the final step that the OS runs before in order to get into. So after this, you just get into your application. Okay, So after this, you move into the user land. So it's the final step to the OS, the final instruction that the OS runs to tell the system that I'm done with my processing. Now I just want to get back to my application and continue on with it. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is what happens on interrupts, okay? So this is a critical aspect of interaction with the OS. Unlike programs, these are event-based, and I would want you to pay particular close attention to how these things work. So essentially the way the interrupts work is first the hardware calls the operating system at a specified location. So this is a hardware call, okay? So like you hit a keystroke on your keyboard, and then the keyboard sends an interrupt back to the, uh, you know, through physical wires, finally it reaches the CPU where essentially the CPU stops and says, hey, I'm going to call the operating system. And in order to speed up the process, in the sense that if you had multiple interrupts happening from different devices, if you want to disambiguate between them, essentially in software you need a giant switch case, okay, slow. So what the hardware people did is, okay, they decided to give you certain support by giving these interrupts numbers and different devices go on different numbers. So that as soon as you see a number, uh, a specified number, you know that that's the, you know, what kind of interrupt it was or which device it came from. 
Okay. So when you're in the, just before you run the interrupt handler, you were running something else, right? So the hardware has stopped you from running whatever you were running currently. So what the OS first needs to do is save state. So this is the state of the program and make sure that once the interrupt is finished processing, the program can continue to run. Because the program is completely unaware of this whole thing. So program does not know anything about this interrupt handling itself, okay? So it's up to the OS to make sure that that illusion is not broken, okay? And then what happens is um, your operating system identifies the device and the cause of the interrupt, and it responds to the interrupt. So it does, so for example, in a keystroke, it would save the character that was hit on the keyboard, and then finally it would uh, maybe display it on the screen if needed, and then wants to return back to the program. So what it does then, it, the state that was saved in the second step would be restored over here. So you save the state, you restore the state, you do the reverse actions, and restart up the program. In order to restart, you're still in operating system mode, remember that when you're restoring the state. The final instruction is this RTI. When you do the RTI, your OS goes from OS LAN to application user LAN, okay, and returns to the user program. And finally, the user program, completely unoblivious to the fact that the interrupt actually happened, uh, starts to run again. And the important thing to notice is that none of this is visible to the user program. When your user program is running, you know, there's a lot of different hardware devices pinging it for different reasons, and the user program is, does not need to deal with any of this. It's the operating system that deals with it. You have interrupts for two different reasons. One is for performance purposes, so the application wants to ping a I.O. device that takes a long time, and the application doesn't want to wait around to, you know, receive that. It just wants to go do something else. So it's used in such cases. It's also used in the case where the hardware wants to interact with the uh, application itself. So the, the subject that the hardware wants to tell the oper the application. In such cases, like for example, your touch screen, right? You, you touch something, it needs to tell the user that you touched a certain part of the screen. So in such cases also, um, it's all handled through interrupts. Okay. So what we're gonna look at next is a simple figure of the interrupt controller. So what you have is you have, uh, normally you have your network, okay? And these are all your hardware devices, okay? All of these have physical wires, okay? These wires here. And they go to something known as an interrupt controller, okay? The interrupt controller itself has three portions. So it has a priority encoder. It has an interrupt mask. We'll get to what that is in a second. Uh, software interrupts are these special cases I said where the application itself might call an interrupt to handle something. When you have more than one application interacting with each other. And then you have things which are timers, which are special cases, where the timer is just uh, an alarm clock, right? So you set up an alarm that says, wake me up in 10 milliseconds, right? So the timer keeps running after a certain period, it wakes up the OS. And finally, the interrupt controller itself is the one that interacts with the CPU, and it provides the interrupt ID, which we've already spoken about, and it also provides this, the interrupt line itself to say that, hey, there is an interrupt with the CPU checks periodically. Okay. Finally, the, um, the control itself will return back, um, and there's also something known as NMI, which stands for non-maskable interrupt. That is, it goes in conjunction with this interrupt mask. So interrupt mask says certain interrupts I cannot handle right now. So for example, if you have rapid keystrokes on the keyboard, um, it may not handle it, okay? So interrupt mask essentially says once the first keystroke is registered, for a certain short time window after that, the uh, keyboard interrupt is master. You won't handle further interrupts on the keyboard. A non-maskable interrupt is essentially a high priority interrupt that says, I cannot be stopped. In a sense, it doesn't matter what the OS is doing, I will have to be handled right then and there. So this would be critical for latency sensitive uh, hardware devices.
Okay, so think of a touch screen. And if you missed uh, touch on the touchpad, then obviously it's a bigger problem than, for example, a network packet was received a little bit later. Okay, so I can live with my network suddenly slowing down, but I cannot live with if my touch screen stopped responding. Right, because I wasn't handling taking the interrupts in the OS. Okay, so there are multiple steps to this. So the interrupts are invoked with interrupt lines from the devices themselves. The interrupt controller chooses an interrupt request to honor. So that's your priority encoder. So the CPU has some control over the priority. So it figures out what order these interrupts are going to be handled in if there's more than one in the same time. Then it checks the mask. So the mask will tell you which interrupts the CPU is willing to handle at this point. And then the priority encoder picks the highest enabled interrupt and sends it to the CPU. Okay, and then there are other ones just software interrupt, uh, which the application can essentially call an interrupt if needed with an I, just called an int instruction. And then the interrupt identity is specified with the ID line so that the OS can handle this. Okay, and the CPU does have the ability to disable all interrupts with a simple flag. Okay, except for the non-maskable interrupt. Okay. So here I'm going to run through what happens on a network interrupt. So first thing is you have these instructions that are running on the CPU, some program, OS, anything could be running at that point. Okay. And then you have an external interrupt which causes a pipeline flush. So you stop all instructions at this point and you save the state. Okay. Then what happens is that your state is all saved and you disable or enable interrupts based on whether you want to handle other one interrupts at the same time when you're handling this one or whether you don't want to handle anything else okay so that's done using a flag so no interrupts are delivered if so no interrupts okay? so no interrupts are delivered if this flag is set okay then the you you, once you break it to supervisor mode, you raise the priority. So the window between this step, which is the second step, the so second step itself takes some amount of time, right? And the third step where the OS is ready to handle further interrupts, the priority is all dropped. So essentially no other interrupts will be handled. So you drop down the priority when you start saving the state. Once that half finishes up, then the OS re-enables all interrupts um, and you save all the registers and you dispatch to the interrupt handler. Okay, So this is all standard. It's common across all the interrupts. And the stuff below the green is also common to all most interrupt cases. This is the one that's interrupt specific, the green portion. Okay, So in this case, it's a network interrupt. So it starts with a network packet from the hardware. So normally that's just a circular buffer into which you read the bytes from the network packet and you just stick it in and you know into kernel buffer so the packet saved you possibly send back an acknowledgement if needed and to the hardware itself and then you you return so you do, you do the reverse essentially you restore the registers you clear the interrupt uh, you disable all interrupts you restore the priority and then you do an RTI so you don't want an interrupt between these last three instructions. Okay, so between the point at which you're trying to get back to the user program and you having to store the state because that would be bad. Okay, and essentially you disable and enable interrupts using a CPU flag. So there's a flag uh, bit that the interrupt um, controller checks, and if the flag is set, then it won't handle it. And finally, you restore the PC and get back to user mode. All right. So 